Good morning to you and welcome. My name is Harold Kim. I'm one of the pastors and privileged to bring to you God's Word. We've been continuing to go through this series, uh, Real Life Relationships, and today we hit upon marriage. So if you have your Bibles, it'll also be projected overhead. It's uh, the book of Malachi, which is the final prophet of the Old Testament. Uh, depending upon how you pronounce it, he can sound Italian. But Malachi chapter 2, verses 13 to 15, we'll begin here. Before we get to verse 13, Malachi the prophet tells God's people that God is against his people because they have forsaken their first love with God himself. And then he goes on to a second challenge, a second rebuke. And we pick up there in verse 13. I'll read it for us. And the second thing you do, you cover the Lord's altar with tears with weeping and groaning because he no longer regards the offering or accepts it with favor from your hand. But you say, why does he, why does he not? Because the Lord was witness between you and the wife of your youth, to whom you have been faithless, though she is your companion and your wife by covenant. Did he not make them one with the portion of the spirit in their union? And what was the one God seeking? Godly offspring, so guard yourselves in your spirit, and let none of you be faithless to the wife of your youth. Okay, this is God's word for us uh, so far. Uh, I'm sure you've heard it said, go get married, go get married, why? Get married because you've fallen in love. I mean, who hasn't heard that? Get married because you're in love. I understand that the Puritans, centuries ago, used to say, get married in order to fall in love. We have two competing models of marriage right there, don't we? The first, I would suggest to you, is a consumption model. It's a consumer's model of marriage. And the second, get married in order to fall in love, is a biblical concept. It's a biblical idea. It's a covenantal love. God said through his prophet Malachi, she is your companion, friend, and the wife of your youth by covenant. Verse 14. According to God, marriage is a covenant, and marriage happens by making one. When Adam was jumping up and down, singing a love song, a poem over beautiful Eve, he made a verbal vow, and that verbal vow was a covenant ratification oath. When he said, bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, he was making a covenant in the eyes of God with his wife. And Adam went on to say, he or she, a man will leave his father and mother, cleave to his wife, hold fast to his one wife, and the two will become one flesh. The two will become one flesh through sexual union. That is the physical vow, the physical ratification oath. You see, from the dawn of time, not by human invention or a human idea, but by God's gifting and institution called marriage, It's meant to be a covenant, and we are to learn covenantal love. Covenant is a biblical concept that describes a relationship that God has with his own people, and of course then, it should be reflected in the most exclusive and intimate of all human relationships. So this morning, I want to cover with you four dimensions of the covenant of marriage. Four scriptural dimensions of the covenant of marriage. First, first. Verse 15, we read, and did he, God, not make them one with the portion of the Spirit in their union? Well, what this tells us is that God himself, by his Spirit, is present at every single wedding. Whether you invited him or not. 
whether you acknowledge him or not, whether he's on the guest list or not, but because wedding is such a beautiful, precious thing to God, he shows up at every wedding. Did you know in the state of California, I've had some friends who had no ecclesiological training or seminary training or religious training or Bible training. They just go and sign a some simple kind of certificate online and they are able to officiate weddings. So in the state of California, literally anybody can officiate a wedding. Anybody can preside a wedding. There's no requirements. And I happen to think, of course, that that is too casual and too convenient. But in any case, God here says, doesn't really matter because God himself actually presides over every wedding. Even the delusional ones, even the spontaneous ones, even the Las Vegas ones. Malachi says, God is a witness, he probably is the primary witness, at every wedding. Because in the eyes of God, the covenant of marriage far surpasses the significance of human contracts. Human contracts. Contracts are horizontal. They're humanly binding. There's benefits and liabilities attached. If you keep your end of the contract, especially as a business, you should see increased revenue, increased income, increased customers or clients, rewards, riches, reputation, so on and so forth. But if you break that contract, that will bring about fines and bad Yelp reviews and social media trolls and lawsuits and breakdowns. Covenants, covenants are more than human contracts because they are triangular and vertical. Covenants involve a greater third party where God himself is the witness. And did you notice this somewhat scary part, provocative part, Malachi the prophet challenges, do you ever feel like your prayers are bouncing off the wall and your spiritual condition has grown so stale? Seems like nothing is going on. You feel congested. Malachi here preaches, well, one of the reasons could be is that you've stopped loving the wife of your youth. One of the reasons could be that God is against your offerings and will not even accept your prayers because you have forsaken and broken the marital covenant. Wow. So maybe one of the greatest things that we all as husbands and wives should check to renew are our marriage vows because the covenant of marriage means this much to God. Now follow with me. If God says he shows up as a witness at every wedding, then I think that signals to us there will come a point in time that all of us will actually want to bail out. If God takes the covenant of marriage so seriously and he rejoices over it for his own glory, that he presides over every wedding, I think that signals and actually prophesies to us at one point or another, you're going to want to tap out, check out, wave the white flag. You see, what will keep two people who are so different together? Are you going to look to your spouse? We just continue to look at how lovely or beautiful your spouse once was. You know, early on in my marriage to Sonny, she actually used to call me every day and with a tender voice actually say, Hi, how are you doing today? It's so far back, I had to purposely try to remember it for the sermon very early on. Nowadays, every day I call her on the way to church or wherever I'm going, and she answers with, what? <laughs> when your covenant or relationship of marriage gets very, very dry and difficult, who or what is going to keep that together? Are you going to continue to look at your spouse? In a lot of your minds, it's your spouse who brought you to this point. Is it going to wait around just for a better situation? Well, situations you cannot control. Are you going to fall back on your academic smarts, your consulting savvy, your business techniques, your management skills, your organizational abilities, your problem-solving techniques? All of you, I assure you, will recognize 
your problems in marriage go way deeper than that. So if you can't look at your spouse, you can't look at your smarts and savvy and skills, you can't look at the situation, then are you just going to fall back? Oh, it's just more of myself. He says, it's me. It's me. Well, okay, I acknowledge it's me. I just got to buck up, do better. It's all about me, and I got to muster up more resources and power. No, 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 my friend. Once again, I'm asking you, what do you do in this situation where you've tapped out? You're already finished. You are defeated and done. And you cannot think about another day together in the same household as a married couple. Can I let you in on something that has come with shock and realization, and it took me many years of my marriage with Sunny for me to even begin to acknowledge and articulate? What if I told you that marriage by design is not meant to end but it is meant to bring an end to yourself. What if I told you that one of the great purposes and vehicles of the institution of marriage was that marriage itself should not end? No, God hates that. He's against it. But he does want to use marriage to bring you to the end of yourself. To bring you to the end of looking at better situations, a better spouse, better smarts, better strategies, and a better self. Now, what if marriage was always from the start because God showed up as a witness to bring you to the end of yourself so much so that you're forced to look up? My friend, God shows up at every wedding as a witness. Not just to sit passively and say, oh, good luck from here but to be actively involved that every time you look up, not just horizontal, the covenant of marriage can actually be kept. Here's a second dimension, second dimension. Marriage is binding. By nature, the covenant of marriage is binding, therefore beneficial. Marriage is binding, therefore beneficial. For some reason, the way that this phrase falls on my heart is so endearing. It captures my heart. Twice, Malachi says, she's the wife of your youth. Takes me back to puppy love or your first love or the first person you fell in love. It kind of reminisce about that. But what I really like about this phrase, the wife of your youth You see, Malachi is saying it's meant to last. It's meant to go long. Oh, it's so challenging. But it's binding, therefore beneficial. Lasting marriage partners all report, religious or not, the benefits of greater happiness, stability, psychology, emotional wealth, actual wealth, health, work, productivity, parenting, so on and so forth. Even they live longer lives. God calls us to make covenantal vows to stay together because there are benefits beyond our present grasp. And those of you right there teetering on the fence, right in the middle of that season that seems oh so hellish, I want you to just simply look up and listen just a little this morning. There can be benefits beyond our present understanding. In a film based upon Marilyn Monroe, she says to this young, strapping, handsome young man, you know I've been married three times already. How did that happen? And the younger man volunteers himself and says, I know, you're just looking for the right man. Marilyn Monroe comes back and says, they always look right from the start. If you check out too quickly, you trust God too little, you don't fight for it enough, you don't clean out the record of wrongs and actually learn to forgive, You stubbornly cling to an individualized, romanticized, self-interest concept of love. 
You stay brooding and bitter. You keep score. Well, then you won't reap the benefits of learning to love and to be loved. Might be the greatest skill in life we could ever learn. Learning to love someone else and to be loved the way that God has loved you. Marriage is beneficial because it's binding to get you to do that. So how come people just don't stay together? This is nice. When I come to a church, I hear about models, I hear about ideals. Once again, very nice. But my parents didn't stay together. That was awful. Right now, I'm trying to run away as far as I can from being anything like my parents' mess, uh, messed up, broken marriage. How come people don't stay together? How come they don't stay bound and wait until they reap the benefits? Have you heard another saying that love is blind? Love is blind? So true. There's a better saying. Marriage opens your eyes. Marriage opens your eyes wide. And you and I are going to begin to discover something and be exposed to something that none of us really like. None of us like this. You're going to get defensive about it. You're going to try to out-rationalize it. You're never going to check it for counseling for it. You might even get angry about it. You might get overwhelmed because you're scared of it. But marriage is binding because it's guaranteed to show you you're not that good. We all signed up for marriage thinking that it would inflate and increase our assumption that I'm really good. But what do you do when it does the reverse? When you begin to see and feel and sense your evil. Can we put that word there? That it could be wicked and evil? especially to our marriage partner, those we love who are closest to us, and you begin to see and sense his or her evils, and you start to f feel utterly depressed and broken down and wholly unable to fix it. See, what I'm trying to tell you, more or less, in this entire real-life relationship series is, see, religion's not enough. Religion is not enough for real life relationships, let alone with God. Religion, which works on the principle, if you are good to me, then I will be good to you. Makes perfect sense in business, makes perfect sense in religion, makes perfect sense in Old Testament religion, which never worked. Goodness itself doesn't even work. Do you know what we really need in real life? I know I need it. We need a miraculous breakthrough movement not from just two people trying to be so good or pretending that they're good we need a miraculous breakthrough from goodness to grace grace is a supernatural gift and power and ability to do good to someone who is no good to you Grace is a spiritual gifting of God that gets people to do good things to the very person who did no good to you. Marriage is binding, therefore beneficial. Well, you'll never stay bound without grace. Now, here's what I'm not saying. Here's what I'm not saying. You can stay together in a relationship all the way till you die without grace. Absolutely. You can have a, relatively speaking, very happy marriage without the grace of God. But I assure you at the seat of your soul, you won't ever be moved by gratitude and you won't be that joyful. Happy and joy is different. Ask me on a sidebar. 
Because without grace, anytime you're wronged or hurt or slighted or overlooked or forgotten, you keep score, you hold grudges, and for the rest of your life, you're going to feel like that person owes me. You can stay in a marriage relationship, but you'll have very little gratitude or joy because without grace, it's purely on a business transaction mechanism. And the premier mark of all of graceless marriages is when you correct someone's wrongs. Oh, and you're going to see a lot of them. And guess what? They're going to be repeated. Like you told them once, but they're going to do it again the next day. Then you told them a second time. They're going to continue to do it again the third time. Hundreds of times. And you can really tell when a person is inundated with grace in how they correct someone's wrongs. Because nobody is going to give grace better than the person who needs it for himself. Nobody dispenses grace well unless you yourself have seen and felt how desperately you need grace for yourself. I've lost count. I really have. How many times God has shown up, saved, healed, convicted, blessed, changed my perspective, changed my wife's, protected and renewed my marriage, until, my, my marriage until this day. All, all, surely, by the grace of God. And there's a richness and a joy and a gratitude and a graciousness that fills my heart now that I could have never tasted unless Sonny and I Made it to this point. And even better things are yet to come. That's what God promises me. The covenant of marriage. God shows up as a witness. Second, marriage is binding, therefore beneficial. Here's third. Marriage means to commit the future in spite of all change or circumstance. Marriage means to commit your future self in spite of all change or circumstance. If you expect to carry marriage on the basis of your present feelings, your present prowess, your present resume, impulses, and determination, you have not understood or properly been prepared for marriage as a covenant, covenant. Let me give you an example of this. We started with two contrasting competing models of marriage. One was a consumption model. And the second was covenantal. Let me give you an example. If you have kids, if you have kids, we love them. This location in particular, I believe God will send more and more families with kids. <laughs> Parent, can I ask you, how did you start loving your kids? Oh, for a lot of you, to be honest, the older you get, if it's your third or fourth, it's a complete shock. It was almost forced on you. And you began to love your child by doing deeds of sacrifice and selflessness and losing sleep. And let's just be objective here. You really don't get anything in return. You have an utterly desperate, needy child all day, every day, for how many years? There's no return. There's no benefits here. And what happens? After years and years and years and years and years of acting in love and sacrifice for your child, whether or not you felt it or not, what happens? I don't know hardly any parent, religious or not, even if they go through a separation or a divorce, who do not have strong feelings for their children. You know what happened? You were forced to act out the covenant of love. And a covenantal love means you act and commit your future self and you continue to do good and you act lovingly to a person and you don't wait around for the feelings. And then lo and behold, for a lot of couples, after they become empty nesters, after the kids all leave and your job is done in a sense, the husband and wife find it very difficult to stay together because they haven't been functioning on a covenantal level, it's been consumption where you only act loving when you feel loving, 
when you're only good to someone because they have been good to you. And my friend, this is precisely why Jesus Christ is utterly essential in all flourishing real life relationships. Because when the grace of Jesus Christ enters into your hard heart, and you find that someone was good to you when you were no good. He was broken, but I should have been broken. He was cursed, but I should have been cursed. He was condemned, but I should have been condemned. I broke that contract. But God comes back and says, I'll make a new covenant. And where you have royally sinned, and where you have royally failed your end, I will cover with my life and my death and all my blood and give you grace. My friend, grace is how you stay bound without being ungrateful and joyless and ungracious and therefore reap all the benefits, but it's also by grace that you can commit your future self and say it with a straight face in spite of all change or circumstance. A covenant, a covenant. Mm. Listen to marriage vows that you might hear at every wedding. And I want you to tell you, no human philosopher or poet came up, came up with these words. They couldn't even think of it. It's borrowed from the beginning of time from God and his holy revelation. Here's what crazy people say when they get married. I, blank, take you, so-and-so, to be my lawfully wedded husband or wife, to have and to hold from this day forward, for better or for worse, for richer or for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish for as long as he both shall live. Please break down those vows. No conditions. It's not about compatibility, whether you've met my needs and expectations or moods. It's not about your charms. No circumstances involved. These vows do not hint even remotely that you are saying, well, I only want to love you when it's easy to love you. I'm signing up for this because I know you're an easy to love person or I want to love you in costless ways. Most people, again, who misexpect, I, there's a perfect soulmate out there for me. There's someone who's perfect for me. Yes, that romantic notion has harmed us really, really badly. Because that is code for saying you want a person who's nearly a finished product. Not a messy one, not a broken one, not a tiring one, not an irritating one, not an impatient one, not a hurtful one, not a dysfunctional one, not a flawed one, not a selfish one, not a sinful one. Certainly, you don't want anyone like you who is in need of so much love and grace that God himself said from the start, I'm not only going to show up as a witness, I'm going to give you my spirit so you can do it. Marriage means to commit your future self in spite of change or circumstance to God, by God, and for the glory of God. Passions come and go. We all change but the essence of marriage means that you promise and vow not to change. Even in the midst of every change. Here's the fourth, last one, and we close. First was marriage has God as a witness in the covenant of marriage. Second, marriage is binding, therefore beneficial. Third, marriage means to commit the future in spite of change or circumstance. Here's the fourth. Here's the fourth. Probably most important. Marriage works best by worshiping and loving God above all. Marriage works best by worshiping and loving God above all. Adam lost his mind when he saw Eve. She was naked, by the way. Pristine, beautiful, gift of God. Lost his mind, wrote a poem, a song. 
fell head over heels in love. He adored her, affections for her, aroused by her, couldn't get enough of her. But at least in the beginning, he never worshipped her. Adam was stunned by Eve, but worship was reserved for God. We have to get that order right. You have to keep that order right. And you must repeat that order regularly. I love what John Piper, theologian, pastor, professor, wrote for his own son on his wedding day. The greatest gift you give your wife is loving God above her life. And thus I bid you now to bless. Go love her more and go love her less. Your greatest problem in all relationships and my greatest problem in all relationships, let me just sum it up. This is by God's own diagnosis. Your greatest problem and mine in all love relationships is not that you love so-and-so too much. Your greatest problem, my greatest problem, is not about how much you love so-and-so. Your greatest problem, my greatest problem, is that we love God too little. We don't love him, love him enough. And that's going to drain and distort all your other loves. If you don't really pay attention to worshiping and loving God above all, who is love? Who is the source of all love? Who is the pinnacle standard of pure love? Selfless love. How, how can we love? I love giving you like Cliff Notes versions of books. I give you book reports so that you don't have to read the book. Book entitled, What Did You Expect by Paul Tripp? And his conclusion boils down to this. Bottom line, bottom line. I love it when authors say bottom line because I'm like, that's all I have to read right there. The war for our marriages is a war of worship. The fundamental problem of every marriage is misplaced worship. You love yourself too, too much. Everyone's been kind of telling you that, hinting at it. Like you're egocentric. You're too prickly. You just talk about yourself too much. You're too much about money. You overwork. You're always stressed. That's all you think about. You're addicted to this. You, you love this. And on and on and on it goes. And the problem of every marriage is misplaced worship. The cure for every marriage is renewed worship of God. I mean, much more on this, on conflict resolution, when two people have competing objects of worship. That'll be in May as we just finish off this whole series on real life relationships. I mean, what, what would real life relationship series be, be without a, at least one extended talk on how you resolve conflicts? But Paul Tripp is telling us there is nothing more uniting. There's nothing more healing. There's nothing more that's going to get you see eye to eye than both parties working at worshiping and loving God above all. You do have to work at it, though. Your marriages don't coast. I'm sorry to tell you that as your pastor. I haven't seen one marriage coast and just get better. They usually just get worse. It takes work to actually worship and love God above all. You have to actually turn off the phone. You've got to turn off that game. You've got to put down the book. You gotta say, I'm gonna get less sleep. You're gonna have to say, I'm not gonna go out here. We're gonna actually pray, read, sing, get our hearts stirred together 
toward the worship and love God above all. And when you do that, when you do that, when you do that little work, let's see how God works. Today, exactly today, 16 years ago, my wife lost her mind and married me. I remember still to this day, beaming with delirium and pride, clueless about what lay ahead. So I was just smiling the whole time. The doors open. She came in with her dad, young Al Pacino looking gangster dude. I love him. And Sonny just was bawling. You've heard this, but not mild crying. Not like, oh, I'm so grateful, inspired for this day. No, heaving, convulsing, nose dripping, just the whole body shaking, crying all the way down the aisle. And in my twisted brain, in some sense, that made me happy because I thought, we can only get better from here. (laughs) We can only improve from here. And little did I know, we did not get better from there. We hit new lows. We hit new bottoms and bottoms that made the previous bottoms look like that was a cakewalk. And those bottoms that made both of us feel down to our soul. Maybe this marriage should end. And then we've hit highs that made us thank God that God didn't let this marriage end. But here's what I know so far. As high and as good as it can get, you are dealing with the heart here that is as restless as they can be. And I still, I still, I still haven't found what I'm looking for. Oh, that song is so true. No how matter how good a marriage can get, I still want more. Go figure. And then no matter how bad or broken a marriage can be, you might have been once married, twice married. Or you might be waiting. Think your life is not worthwhile until you get married. Can I tell you this morning, my friend? You cannot, if you are loved by Christ, miss out on the very best that is yet to come. You cannot. Because in Revelation chapter 21, when Apostle John sees the future by the Spirit of God, and he says, God says, behold, all things are new. In the new heavens and the new earth, all things are new. That includes marriage. Marriage is now pale in comparison to the grand finale. And marriages themselves will dissolve because the meaning of our lives and into eternity is not our marriage. It is all about, are you married to the Lamb, the Lamb of God? And in the wedding banquet that will take place into the end of history, into the never, ever, ever hereafter, into forever, the marriage of the Lamb. Here's what it's going to be like. Nobody's going to cry. No one's going to fear. No one's going to stress because Jesus cried most bitterly once and for all. Nobody's going to hurt because Jesus hurt. No one's going to break promises because Jesus keeps all of his. There'll be no despair, no desertion, no breakups, no death because Jesus put death to death. And if you have a real life relationship Filled with his love, that is the only love that's guaranteed to turn into happily forever after. Let me pray for us as we close. Father in heaven, thank you. That you instruct us about every area of life and especially our marriages. But God, I thank you that you don't just give us instructions. You give us a person, you give us power, you give us the presence of your spirit who does miracles of changing our hearts inside out. And I pray, O oh Lord, that you would bring renewal and healing and an increase of blessedness and binding and benefit to all the married couples here. 